Okay. Uh, I'll make the introduction first in, in French, and then uh, I'll say a few, a couple of words in English. Uh, bienvenue uh, au séminaire en informatique. Uh, je voudrais vous avertir que après cette série qui va terminer en mois d'avril, il y aura une école d'été sur le même thème dans les deux premières semaines, le long des deux premières semaines de juin. De juin. Vous êtes euh, tous invités. Alors, notre invité, notre, notre conférencier aujourd'hui est Gary Lupian, qui est professeur de psychologie à l'Université de Wisconsin, à Madison. Good night. All right. I think you might be muted. Oh, are you muted? I can hear you out here. No, we hear you. This one shouldn't be. Oh, I see. Sorry. Yeah, no, we, we hear you, Stephen. Can you hear me? Oh, well, it's important that... Did you, uh, Gary, did you just hear what Steve said, Steve Hansen said? He said, we hear you. Did you hear that? I did. No, not not Gary Cottrell, <laughs> Gary Lupian. There is a problem with the... Well, you're, uh, uh, Stephen, you're showing muted on uh, the bottom scroll of your screen, but I'm not this sure. One, but if I turn it on, you're going to hear a horrible echo, you see? Yeah, but now does he hear it? Uh, he doesn't. Uh, that's weird. Uh, is that TV so? No. What can I do? Gary, can you hear me? He did before. Something changed. No idea how to fix this. Um, uh, he's a professor at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, il travaille sur la, la langue uh, naturelle et uh, comment ça comme, comment ça donne l'échafaudage à la cognition humaine. Il va expliquer ce que c'est que l'échafaudage dans sa présentation et, et il uh, remet en question uh, il cherche à répondre à la question concernant le fonction de uh, il commence il commence à se sans la, la capacité de langage. Il étudie aussi l'évolution du langage et les façons dont le langage euh, s'adapte euh, aux, aux impératifs des, des apprenants et des utilisateurs. Sa conférence euh, s'intitule Qu'est-ce que c'est ah ben, qu -ce qui compte comme en compréhension Qu'est-ce que c'est que la compréhension Et euh, je. Puisque vous êtes là et puisque, puisqu que, puisque lui va parler l'anglais, je vais le permettre de vous expliquer de quoi il s'agit. OK, I've given your French introduction. Everybody already knows that you're a professor of uh, psychology at West Wisconsin in Madison and that you work on the relation between language and cognition. And you're going to tell us what, um, what you mean by scaffolding and your... your, your um, theme is one that's been running through all of these seminars. Uh, it has two sides because they're mirror sides. One is meaning and the other mirror side is understanding, or if you like, understanding meaning. And we're going to be speaking about what counts as understanding. And I imagine that somewhere in the background will also be large language models that give the impression of understanding. Yes. Some yes. People. Okay. With yeah. That, I'm happy to welcome Gary Lupian. Oh, I forgot to ask you, uh, do you accept questions during your presentation? Yes. Or... Yeah, during is fine. Yep, okay. absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, everyone, for joining. And uh, most talks I give have a element of persuasion in them. I often try to convince the audience that one view, one perspective, one theory is more right than another one. And I realized as I was putting this together that uh, this is not one of them. I have, uh, as I'll share with you, some opinions on what counts as understanding, but it's more of a meditation on uh, how to think about understanding and what to make of this strange time um, with respect to oh. large language models and AI that we're uh, living in. And so, uh, as- wow. so, so Gary, you, you, yeah. you talk while you meditate? I uh, I actually, I don't <laughs> meditate and I uh, have never been interested in meditating. And I think 
uh, I've been studying inner speech over the last few years as a project in my lab and uh, realized that most people have a lot more inner speech than I do. And uh, that might have something to do with me not really understanding the point of meditation as I you know, <laughs> quiet down the inner voice, which apparently I, I don't have much of. Um, so many of you have observed this strange dialectic that uh, has been playing out. Um, here's some tweets, okay? The AI hype, just clever token autocompleters obviously do not understand anything. Um, if you're not having conversations with GPT-4, you're missing some intuitions about how much an NLM can understand things. Okay, Grady Booch, the uh, chief scientist for uh, software engineering, IBM Research, um, also introduced I was looking him up, introduced uh, embodied cognition to uh, IBM. Um, language models understand to the same degree that astrological readings predict an individual's future. Uh, someone responded, well, what about all those people claiming otherwise? The ones building the models disagree. Um, uh, they would still be wrong. Um, a uh, New Yorker piece by Jaron Lanier, there is no AI. Uh, Emily Bender has argued uh, a very similar point that there is no, never mind understanding, there's no intelligence in artificial intelligence. Um, right, it's uh, ascribing understanding or intelligence to large language models is like ascribing it to Wikipedia. Now, there is increasing nuance. Um, there are lots of good papers trying to suss out the, the subtleties of, of this uh of this dialectic. Uh here are here are some of them. Sorry to interrupt. Uh Steve has just uh, pointed out that there are a lot of people who have their mics on. Apart from yeah, from Gary Lupian, could you please turn off your microphone during the talk, except if you're asking a question? Sorry, Gary, I interrupted. No worries. Yeah, thanks. So there is increasing nuance, uh, but I, I, I've, I've been increasingly feeling like we're in this position where something has to give. So uh, in a recent uh, preprint, I, I think it's going to be coming out in uh, in uh, Trends in Cognitive Sciences, uh, Yildirim and, and Paul um, suggest correctly that we are in this Kuhnian moment. Um, they're talking about knowledge in particular. Um, understanding is is a part of that same the part of the same discourse. We might be undergoing this conceptual revolution. What knowledge means, what understanding means, uh, what intelligence means. Um, and one of those elements, right, is that okay, uh, if there is none, if there's no understanding, if there's no meaning, if there's no intelligence in these systems, yet they can perform many tasks that we've believed require intelligence, uh, what what does that mean, um, right? And so here's, here's a way of thinking about this. So if knowledge, intelligence, meaning, understanding is required to do something and a system does it, uh, do we, one, question its ability to really do that thing? Maybe it's just an illusion. Maybe someone just cherry picked the data, right? Uh, do we question the premise? Maybe... We thought it required some set of abilities, under, uh, intelligence, understanding to do it, but it doesn't. Um, do we grant the system with knowledge, intelligence, meaning, understanding? Okay. Uh, or do we redefine what it means to know or understand? And of course, this last position risks this spiral of, uh, well, understanding is whatever it is machines can't do. Okay. Um, and so here's here's the journey, uh, today's journey. So I'm going to give some apparent examples of not understanding, um, thinking about what counts as understanding. And thinking about that, it's helpful to start with the opposite. You know, can we agree on some things that don't count? Okay. Um, and then what do we expect from a system that understands something? Um, and I'm going to go through examples where we might both be 
misestimating, underestimating, overestimating in other cases, machine understanding, uh, but also, and there's been much less focus on in, in this recent discourse on human understanding, cases where we uh, are, mis uh, I would argue, misestimating human understanding. And then I'll see if I can provide some recommendations for, uh, for not going crazy, making some progress. Okay, so what doesn't count as understanding? Um, many of you might be familiar with this uh, example. Uh, this is the Sphex wasp, uh, also known as the golden digger wasp. And um, uh, one of its behaviors caught the eye of a famous entomologist in the uh, 1880s originally, is when he wrote about it, Henri Fabre, um, who noticed that this, this wasp uh, does this thing where it uh, stings prey like uh, ka katydids, crickets, and paralyzes them and then drags the prey into its burrow uh, and it will uh, eventually become food for uh, the larva. And um, before dragging it in, it checks to make sure that the burrow is clean and then presumably that the this um, uh, insect that paralyzed uh, can fit. And uh, uh, here's what happens. A great golden digger wasp dragging a kitty did back to its hole. Get it lined up just right with its head going down, and I'll move the kitty did just a little bit. While oh, he's down there checking his hole, and he comes back out, and it's not perfect. So he's going to drag it back. And get the head just lined up. And I'll go down to the hole and check it again, and his kitty did's going to run away again. That is the 67th time I moved it, and I'm getting bored because it keeps on doing the exact same thing. Okay, so this became a famous example of what seems to be this fixed subroutine and a kind of paradigm case of, well, if it understood what it was doing instead of just following an instinct, it should not enter this infinite loop. Now, ordinarily, it works okay because the thing stays put, but, um, right, and uh, so wasps aren't very thoughtful. It seems not to understand the purpose of its own activity. Um, ironically, <laughs> uh, this story is only partially true. Uh, so th these behaviors can be observed, but they are not actually that characteristic. The the wasps do break out of the loop. They they do figure it out. Um, okay, but regardless, I think we would agree that if all you have is this kind of fixed loop, you're behaving, but it seems to lack a certain level of understanding. And uh, the same can be said about uh, machines that do cool things, but clearly their behavior does not require resorting to anything like understanding. So here is a... Um, a Waldo recognizer. Right. Um, we don't need to endow it with any sort of understanding. Um, other things that don't count as understanding, um, a lookup table. So we think that if some behavior can be accomplished by a simple lookup table and our testing reveals that that's kind of what's what's happening, well, you know, you look something up, you have a key, you have a value, you don't need to ascribe anything additional to it. Now, probably the most famous lookup table of all is Searle's Chinese room. And uh, we it would take us too far afield to point out all the, the problems with this thought experiment, but it rests on this intuition that if if we think the system is a lookup table, we just really resist, no matter how impressive the behavior might be, if the underlying mechanism is a lookup table, we just really resist uh, ascribing uh, any sort of understanding to the system. Um, and that's kind of similarly what's going on with Lanier's uh, argument, where the underlying metaphor here is that LLMs are basically complex da databases, right? And so it's useless to talk about intelligence or understanding. Um, also simple recall, right? 
So this is um, a tweet. It's referring to an example that uh, Murray Shanahan uh, was giving in a, in a in a paper, where uh, because these models are autoregressive predictive models, the idea is that the underlying mechanism in the way that they give the answer to both of these questions is the same. We can take issue with that, right? Um, but in one case, it's just prediction, twinkle, twinkle, little what star, you don't need to understand anything to answer this question. But when a person answers a question like what countries to the south of Rwanda, right, we assume that it's not just simple recall. And if it is, then that doesn't demonstrate real understanding. Rather, we assume that the person has a much richer world model, knowing uh, what a country is, knowing what South means, not just in the context of this question, but more generally, right? So it's it's not just simple recall. And if it is, we would question uh, that there's any understanding involved. Um, lastly, a system that understands should not commit catastrophic errors. Um, so there are lots of errors that we can um, ascribe to just inattention, but there are some errors that seem to signal, okay, something is really wrong here. And um, I love this example from uh, Charles Babbage, who, uh, of course, is, uh, among other things, the inventor of the, um, the difference engine. Here's a model of it, a machine, kind of an analog computer for computing uh, values of polynomials. And um, uh, there is a, a quote uh, of his... Um, talking about public reception of this. Uh, on two occasions, I have been asked, pray, Mr. Babbage, if you put into the machine wrong fingers, will uh, figures will the right answers come out? I'm not able to rightly, rightly to apprehend the kind of confusion of ideas that could provoke such a question, right? So for someone to ask a question like this signals that they're, they're, they're very confused about not some detail of how this works, but the underlying concept itself. Um, Gary, will you give me and, a, yeah. a question? Yes. You said that, that earlier on in your talk, when you actually when you when you mentioned Searle, you said that's another instance of this interpretation that it's all just looking up, look up in a in a in a passive table. But yeah, that's not what computation is. It's a that's right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, so I, I, I should, uh, it's it's true, right? So Searle allowed the, the table to be updatable, right? So it's just about following rules, yeah. Um, I, I think the, uh, the, the question of whether a fixed sort of routine could produce behavior that is indistinguishable from, um, from a person is, kind of an unwarranted assumption that Searle was making. But I I I I wanna, yeah, I wanna go on. Um yeah, so one uh a lot of uh, examples of uh LMs in this case, uh Dolly uh failing to understand come from these sorts of uh commissions of what we deem to be catastrophic errors, such that if the system understood what we take to be a central property of some phenomenon, uh, it would not make the kind of error that it makes. Okay, so uh, make a Where's Waldo picture. Here's your Where's Waldo style picture. Have fun trying to spot the character. Um, and I, I tried it myself. Uh, I I could not uh, get it to produce a, uh, a hard to find Waldo. Uh, yeah, here's a display where Waldo is hard to find. I got them to be smaller. Um, here's one with just one Waldo that is hard to find. We know arithmetic is not a strong suit of especially uh, the, the generative image models. Um, okay. So it seems to be missing the point, right? Here's another last one. Uh, Arvind um, Narayanan. Uh, every time a new chatbot is released, I play rock, paper, scissors with it and ask it to go first. Then I ask why I seem to keep winning. Uh, Google's Gemini advanced. All right. So 
There's an underlying assumption here that this would be easy for people um, and it would be kind of totally obvious. And if it's not, you're missing something and it signals an underlying lack of understanding. Okay, um, now defining understanding is notoriously difficult. Most people are, uh, I, I would put them in the category of, of confidently wrong. So same uh, Twitter thread, what, what, what does it mean to understand? Oh, it's meta knowledge, I understand, I can have a theory, I can explain it. Uh, those are all non-starters, right? Uh, if we're talking about being able to explain it, that rules out that nonverbal, well, that other animals, that kids before they have full command of language are able to understand anything. This is this is wrong, I think. Um, and um, as the next tweet points out, well, ChatGPT can explain it to you. Um, so, so, so what now? Um, if we think about the kinds of behavior, uh, the kinds of properties of a system that understands that that we tend to look for, uh, he, here are three. And there are others that one could add, um, ability to explain meta-knowledge. Um, we might we might want to consider to what extent is sentience uh, relevant here. Um, things like having an internal world or situation or causal model, um, I would put that under these three properties that, that might be required for good enough generalization, for good enough uh, use of relevant knowledge, but those are not in themselves sort of the properties. They're just a means of getting uh, to these properties. Um, and so I'll go through a few of them and then compare uh, machines and and people and see kind of what, what conclusions we might be able to reach. Um, okay, so um, here I'll start with some um, examples where researchers, I think, have been... Uh, you know, well-meaning researchers, they're not trying to just make a point, uh, but well-meaning researchers might misestimate machine understanding and, and human understanding at the same time. So one example is from a recent paper by uh, Dentella et al., where they claim that uh, despite evidence, apparent evidence to the contrary, when you test models, uh, large language models, systematically on, in this case, it's just grammaticality judgments, uh, their behaviors are nothing like what you would expect from a system that uh, has, I mean, they're, they're not even talking about understanding much, just has stable grammatical knowledge of the sort we ascribe to people. Um, and so they give um, different language models a task. That's a metalinguistic judgment task. Is this sentence grammatical or not? The sentences are of different types. And uh, what they find is that for the grammatical ones, the models largely say, yes, it's grammatical. But for the ungrammatical ones, they, because of this yes bias, they tend to um, misclassify them as being grammatical. Um, and so comparing the, on average, the different language models and people, uh, you can see that people distinguish between grammatical and ungrammatical sentences uh, better than um, language models do. Uh, so on the y-axis is mean accuracy. So saying, having low accuracy for ungrammatical means that you're often Mis misclassifying it as grammatical. Um, okay, and they conclude that, well, this kind of misalignment um, shows that the, the knowledge is just not there. Uh, we wrote a commentary recently where we took issue with their conclusions, um, and we pointed out two things. One on the machine side, one on the human side. Um, first, we argue the authors are underestimating the machines. So if instead of having them perform this metalinguistic judgment, one evaluated grammaticality in the way that one uh, has been normally does with these models by looking at uh, the surprisal, uh, uh, the surprisal error, the prediction error, for grammatical and ungrammatical sentences, you can distinguish between grammatical and ungrammatical sentences for uh, nearly all of the sentence types. Um, and moreover, this difference in surprisal between grammatical and ungrammatical sentences, these minimal pairs that we generated, uh, closely corresponds to human judgments of grammaticality. Now, 
There's one type of sentence, center embeddings, that the models have trouble with. And these are sentences like, uh, the ancient manuscript of the grad student who the new card catalog had confused a great deal was studying and the library was missing a page. Okay, that's grammatical. Uh, the novel of the horror author who the publishing company had recently fired was banned by the local library. Uh, that, that's ungrammatical. Uh, so the models have trouble with that. But guess what? People do as well. So this is the author's original data. And um, people are a chance, near chance on these sentences. They actually... Um, think that ungrammatical sentences are more likely to be grammatical than the other way around. Um, but GPT-4s, we use the slightly improved prompt that's actually more in line with what the people, uh, the human subjects were being asked. Um, GPT-4 actually does a better job on this than uh, people do. Um, and this is true across the board. So GPT-4 here is performing in a more normative way than people. And using the logic of the authors, we would be forced to conclude that GPT-4 has kind of greater grammatical knowledge or greater understanding, right? Which we might not want to do, but we, we see here how this, you know, we, we have a situation of both misestimating human uh, knowledge in these tasks and machine knowledge at the same time. Um, of course, even perfect knowledge of grammar does not entail actual understanding. And, uh, Back in 2018, Doug Hofstadter uh, argued that no matter how impressive some of the cutting edge machine translation um, was at the time, uh, the kind of errors the machines were making were a signal that there is no underlying, um, there's no there there, there's no understanding. And, and one of the um, examples, so, and, and Doug pointed out in 2018, and of course, people have continued to make this argument that it is us who is infusing meaning and understanding into these outputs, but they're not, they're not really there. Okay. Um, and one of the examples was um, simple tests of using Winograd sentences. And, and so these are cases like this. So in English, say the trombone didn't fit in the suitcase because it was too small. Uh, what's too small? Um, right, it is ambiguous. You have to bring in your world knowledge to understand what it is referring to. So if you, and this is uh, an example that I generated, and I, I haven't checked whether Google Translate, whether it's it, it now works. So this was Google Translate back, I think in 2019 or so. Um, okay, so um, in Spanish, the translation of the sentence removes the ambiguity, allowing us to see whether the translation is correct. Okay, so, uh, and that's because Spanish has grammatical gender. So uh, trombone is masculine, suitcase is feminine. And so the suffix on small has to agree with either, based on the gender, with either um, the trombone or the suitcase. And in this case, we see it's agreeing with the masculine trombone, right? So the, the translation is that, it's not grammatically ambiguous in this case, it's that, uh, the trombone is too small. Okay, so this is wrong. Um, and these kind of Winograd sentences have been used for quite a while. Uh, this is from an example from Steve Sloman's Causal Models, where he argues that it's not just that it requires some very general world model, it actually requires a very specific and sophisticated causal model to be able to understand that in the first case, uh, he refers to Stephen, in the second case, he refers uh, to David. So it's not just having some general idea of, you know, admire and annoy. It's, it's requiring um, the machinery to be able to parse this according to cognitive science, right? Has to be sensitive to causal structure. And so then what are we to make of the fact that, well, large language models are, are getting these right? Okay, so there's the, the suitcase. Um, I tried it just the other day for, for these kinds of sentences. Uh, it, it works. Now, it doesn't work all the time. And uh, people are better at this than uh, models are, especially when you test it in more uh, rigorous ways than just these kind of one-off sentences. So in a recent paper, this is a preprint, um, causal interventions expose implicit situation models. Um, the authors go through 
kind of progressively more difficult uh, Winograd uh, sentences, testing different models on their ability to make the correct prediction using um, both more lax and very strict scoring criteria. And um, what they find is that, um, so humans here, there's a human baseline, they're 94%. Um, the best performance of GPT-4 with some chain of thought reasoning is at 67. Chance here is zero because you have to get both right. Um, the task is to predict um, the word that fills in the masked word. So Paul tried to call George, but blank wasn't successful. So if it ends on successful, uh, then Paul wasn't successful, right? If it's available, George is not available. So the model has to predict that word in both, cor the correct word in both cases, as do the people. Um, now, they didn't just test the models. They also, that's, that's why there's that causal intervention part in the title. What they did was they injected a representation from a model that saw successful into the an, an ambiguous model to see if it moved the model's prediction uh, into, you know, towards successful and vice versa, showing that encoded in those um, weights was some semblance of a of a relevant world model. It wasn't just specific to, you know, a, a given sentence or a given word. Um, this is a... Uh, uh, these wooden grass sentences are all over the place. This is a this was one of the readings uh, on the recommended re uh, readings list um, back from 2021. So uh, Gary Arcas is a, a Google employee, still is, and so had access to the Lambda model, uh, the one that convinced the the that other guy that you know this model was uh, sentient. Uh, so he was writing about this before ChatGPT, before all of this stuff was public. Um, making some of the same points, right? That what are we to make of the successes of these models on sentences that we have for a long time thought to require having a world model? Okay, so um, something has to give. Now, um, a question we can ask is whether systems we attribute with understanding, do they actually have these properties? And do systems which we think lack understanding lack the properties? And so now I'll, I'll, I'll switch back to some of uh, human data, kind of challenging the idea that um, humans, which we tend to endow with, with understanding, behave in ways that we might expect uh, from systems that understand. Um, so here are some systems that we tend to think have some level of understanding. Uh, these are my kids a year ago. And um, here are some, one might say, catastrophic errors in children's language. Catastrophic in the sense that if a machine made an error like this, we might reasonably question whether it has any idea of what it's talking about. When kids make these errors, and that's my point, uh, we notice them. We think they're funny. We think they're cute. We think they signal that, okay, you know, there's some confusion here, but we certainly do not um, use these errors to then argue there is fundamentally no there there or there cannot be an understanding, right? And I'll come back as to why, okay? So uh, small oranges are called oranges, big oranges are called grapefruit and grapefruit are made of grapes and juice, okay? Um, so about a babysitter, what's a Anita's name? Right? So one might wonder what, what kind of concept of names might a child have to ask a question like that? All right, uh, how about that? I have an idea, we can split it. We can both get the bigger piece. Okay, this was just recently. Um, so the, the smaller one, Finn, has been playing with magnetiles a lot uh, in a little kind of building blocks that are magnetic that attach to one another. And then he noticed that he, he could stick a magnetile onto the fridge and said, I did not know that magnetiles were magnets. Uh, because for him, magnets are things that stick to the fridge, uh, which his, his six and a half year old big brother immediately responded with, their name is literally magnetiles. 
Uh, another famous example from back from the 30s, from Piaget, about children's beliefs about what it means to be alive. Okay, so uh, Piaget had pointed out, uh, um, pointed out that kids, and in this case, the, this kid is uh, seven and a half. So this is not a small kid. Uh, that kids are uh, have a strong bias toward animistic beliefs. So a cat is alive, a snail is alive, a table, no, why not? It can't move. Okay, bicycle, yes, it can go. Uh, clouds, sometimes move. Water, yes. Okay. So there seems to be a kind of a double standard, right? Children's catastrophic errors are taken to be insights into the developmental process. They're recognized as errors, but they're taken to be insights. While similar errors made by language models are often viewed as signs that there is no there there. Now, one response is that, well, it's because children grow up to be competent adults who don't make such errors. Children don't understand things adults do. Do they? Okay, so here is um, some data from Goldberg and Thompson Schill. The task here is participants are given words. It's moderately speed a task. They have a second to make a response. Uh, some words refer to animals, other words refer to plants. The, the task is, is it alive? Okay. You could see that, and there are, and then there are some other things you could see that, that are not alive. Uh, you could see that participants, these are adults, these are undergrads, um, are both more accurate and slower for telling you that plants are alive. Uh, here's some data, similar pattern. Uh, these are biology professors, okay? So notwithstanding what their explanations to the contrary, in people's minds, plants are less alive than animals. Okay, so we have to work hard to avoid making these kinds of errors. Uh, some, uh, some data from my lab from a little while back about formal categories, under, understanding of these kinds of categories. Now, if you ask people to define a triangle, uh, they understand that triangles, there are different kinds of triangles. They, they um, uh, If you ask them to define a triangle, they don't say, oh, it's uh, occasionally, maybe like one in a hundred people will say uh, a pyramid shape, okay? Um, everyone else gives you a definition. What about when you ask them, okay, here are some shapes, some are triangles, some are not triangles. Click on all the shapes that are triangles. <laughs> what happens? Well, people systematically leave out the triangles that they independently, other people have judged as being less typical triangles. It's a minority, but it's about 17% think that that triangle in the bottom right is not really, is not a triangle. Okay. It's not just recognition. You can tell people all triangles have angles that add up to 180 degrees. Select all the shapes that you think have angles that add up to 180 degrees. Okay, uh, and the same kinds of atypical triangles tend to be left out. And these aren't just inattention errors. You can ask people why, and they say things like this. Okay, these are college educated adults, okay, that give correct definitions, um, but it's really hard to not rely on perceptual judgment. Didn't look like when, when it to be a triangle. Okay, consistency. We expect systems that understand to show some degree of consistency. This is a point also made by the Seal German um, Paul paper, where, you know, as impressive as it might be that these text based models can get these kinds of prompts correctly, you know, how can you know how to balance things if you've never had any real experiences? But they point out that. There is this fragility and inconsistency to it. Uh, so it works for box and ball. It doesn't work for spear and um, and cube. Um, I uh, I played around with some of these prompts uh, with slightly larger samples. Uh, GPT Chat GPT three point five uh, is just a chance on this. GPT four does well. Um, 
But like in the other example, when you ask about cubes and spheres, it does badly. Uh, they found 80% here, it's about 60%. So, uh, so it's worse than what they uh, reported. So that's weird, right? Because of course it will tell you that a cube is a uh, sphere and the ball is a box, uh, ball is a, uh, a, a cube. A cube is a box, a sphere is a ball. It'll tell you that and yet be unable to apply it. Uh, well, let's go back to the triangles. So people will tell you that a triangle is a figure with three sides or a three-sided shape or three-sided polygon. If you ask people to draw a triangle, here are the kinds of uh, things they draw. And if you ask them to draw a figure with three sides, the thing that they said was a definition, they draw something a bit different. They tend to draw less typical, more varied triangles. Okay, And, the, and um, I don't have time to go into the reason why there is this kind of greater peakedness of the distribution. The point is that these, although people might tell you that they mean the same things, they don't activate the same mental representations. We see this both in production and in comprehension. So if you hear the word triangle, um, you tend to have this very steep typicality gradient where you're fastest to recognize equilateral triangles, a bit slower on isosceles and slower still on scalene. But if you hear three sides in the context of the task, it's three sides or four sides, um, then, then you're not as sensitive to this typicality. So the point is that these definitionally the same cues lead to activations of different mental representations. Um, now, what's happening here? This is, I, I wanted to dig into it because it's actually um, even more interesting than, than what the authors um, uh, envisioned, which is that there is an unexpected sensitivity to order. So the model is incorrectly kind of being incorrectly sensitive to whether um, cube comes first or sphere comes first. So if you ask about boxes and balls, it doesn't matter which is easier, balancing a ball in a box or a box in a ball, 100% in both cases. If you ask about cubes and spheres, uh, for some reason, um, okay, if you mention cube first, gets it right, if you mention sphere first, it gets it systematically wrong. Um, now, what about human judgments? Are there cases where people are similarly inconsistent when it comes to answering questions in a different order? And, and the answer is yes. And here's one example. Um, so people in survey research are well aware of, of this, this type of bias. So this is uh, an example of a Gallup poll, poll from 97. Do you think blank is honest and trustworthy? Bill Clinton, Al Gore. Okay, Al Gore is more trustworthy than Bill Clinton. Let's now split it up by which person was asked about first, because everyone here rated, gave an answer to both. Um, and um, so Gore has an 18 point lead when mentioned first. So in this non-comparative context, that lead drops to 3% when he's mentioned second. So when you ask about Bill Clinton first and then Al Gore, and there are interesting theories about what explains this. The point is that, you know, people show these kinds of inconsistencies. Um, we, we can also question whether, so the, the authors said that it, the model becomes in, increasingly inaccurate for less frequent terms. Um, I'm not sure that what's happening here is about frequency. It, it, it might be that's something else. So for example, if you ask about balls, boxes, cubes, spheres in a slightly different context, GPT-4 is getting it right 100% of the time. I don't know why. Instead of asking which one is more uh, balanced, you ask just to arrange the objects into a stable vertical configuration. Now it's much more robust. Um, so it's unexpected, but it's not that unexpected if we look at the broader human literature on human judgments and the frequent inconsistencies. Uh, and interestingly, in this context, GPT 3.5, which based on the prior results, we might you know, conclude that, well, it just has no underlying model, no underlying understanding. Now it can do the task. Um, lastly, appropriate use of relevant knowledge. So in, uh, especially in the literature on education, there's this idea of inert knowledge. Uh, and this is one thing that makes education difficult, right? It's why 
It's hard to teach kids uh, that things that they know in one context are often, very often, not correctly transferred, generalized to other contexts. So here's one example. So here is a um, little arithmetic problem. And uh, sixth graders, this is from 1986, uh, are, are, are not doing so well. Now, they obviously know that you cannot right, have uh, half a school bus. But they're not using that knowledge to inform their answer in this problem. Uh, if you think that college students grow out of it, well, they, they do grow out of this particular error. They don't grow out of others. That's what a lot of like math education research focuses on. Why is it that you can know this, but not transfer it to this formally equivalent domain? And it's because of this, this uh, uh, what we call, you know, the tendency to hug the data, right? Um, the knowledge here is not automatically transferred to this other domain. Uh, bit, I'll, I'll skip the video. Um, this is a uh, a video uh, that very rhetorically powerful video uh, filmed at Harvard's graduation in uh, 1980 seven showing that Harvard graduates, many of whom have taken multiple astronomy and physics courses, uh, cannot tell you why there are seasons and they all uh, insist that it, it's because the earth is farther from the sun uh, when it's winter. These same students, as other researchers pointed out, can, uh, these people who, who claim this incorrect model, uh, work in this incorrect model, they also know that when it's uh, summer in the Northern hemisphere, it's winter in the Southern hemisphere, but those that inconsistency, uh, <laughs> that inconsistency has not um, been resolved. Okay, um, and actually, this kind of catastrophic, what seems like a catastrophic error, right? The students who are saying what caused the seasons is uh, the distance of the Earth from the Sun. It's this is not a random thing, right? Uh, what what's happening? It's not just a random error. Uh, what's happening is that they're misapplying the correct model that being closer to a heat source, right? Um, if you have a heat source, you're closer to it, it's gonna be hotter, right? Uh, it's just not relevant in this context. And so this kind of error, right? It's catastrophic in, in that it defeats the main purpose of Where's Waldo, that's why, that's what makes it funny. But notice, right, there is an underlying intelligence here, um, right? It would be much easier to just reproduce, if it's just about a da database, just reproduce a Waldo page, then you'd get it right. Uh, what's, what seems to be happening here is uh, that there's somehow a bias to take the central thing, the, the, the salient thing in a Waldo picture and make it bigger uh, when in, in generating. Interestingly, um, GPT-4, I mean, it's obviously a different model from, from Dolly under the hood here, but it's um, it reasons very appropriately about Waldo and metaphorical extensions. If you ask it, what does it mean if someone says it's like finding Waldo? It, it explains it and so on. Um, and one might conclude from a uh, kind of catastrophic error like this that, okay, there's no there there, but right, there's interesting generalization under the hood. So here's my prom to where uh, generate Waldo, right? So there's kind of compositionality um, at work that. That's that's neat. Okay, um, we're running out of time. I uh, we have a, a Tix paper from uh, a couple of years ago about variability shaping learning and generalization, where we give more examples of um, how um, people have a strong bias to hug the data. To to know that that's why training with greater variability improves performance, but at the cost of, of training time. Um, and uh, let me, yeah, let's, let's jump, jump ahead. So, um, okay, I want to kind of fence off a few obvious critiques here. So, okay, some people lack understanding on some topics. Why is this news? The point is that such demonstrations don't prevent us from claiming that understanding is within the human capacity. Right, and uh, some, you know, Vander Marcus, Lanier, 
uh, Ivanova, have admonished people for being too credulous, right, with respect to understanding, um, attributing understanding to language models. And I would say that they are often overlooking the depths of our own ignorance and our ability to be effective agents despite uh, that, that ignorance. Um, and so uh, some recommendations, and I'll, I'll just uh, be very quick. Use human baselines. There is a lot of uh, research. Um, for example, here's a, a causal, um, something causal reasoning in language models. Uh, large language models are not strong abstract reasoners. Uh, these papers evaluate models and different kinds of reasoning problems. Um, because it's formal reasoning, there's a ground truth, so you can evaluate the accuracy, but there are no human baselines. Uh, these problems are difficult for most people. If people get these wrong, what does that mean about human understanding? The fact that it is within the reach of some people, especially using other resources, being able to write things down, using computers uh, to help them figure it out. Um, do, what what does that what does that tell us? Uh, and that, so the sub point, it, we want to distinguish between what is possible from what is typical. Um, we want more dialogue between computer science and cognitive science. We're leaving a lot at the table. Uh, and uh, uh, lastly, uh, um, we should be more open-minded about multiple reliability of behavior. So whatever the mechanism underlying the Sphex wasps repetitive behavior, I bet a lot of money that it's not a neural implementation of a while loop, uh, no matter how much it may look like to a uh, computationally primed uh, researcher. And um, for me, I feel the, the more I learn, the less I understand, but uh, hopefully this clears up more than it creates confusion. Thanks. Um, and uh, I'm, on, I'm on sabbatical next year at the Santa Fe Institute, where I hope to continue uh, some of these meditations. OK, thanks very much, um, Gary. The, yeah, sorry for running long. Uh, it's all right. We started late. Um, the discussion usually starts somewhat slowly, and so I have the prerogative to ask a few questions to uh, to warm people up. But please um, raise your hands whenever you have a question, and, uh, and I'll hand it over to you. I'll, I think I'll be able to see it. Um, but before I before I ask you a couple of questions, I want to draw to everybody's attention that this series of talks, uh, which is going to continue to April, will also uh, continue in the first two weeks of June, where some of the some of the speakers who have already spoken will be present, or at least participating, because it's a hybrid version, and others who weren't able to come uh, into this series or, or recommended that they be invited. This topic will continue, and it's the much the same topic. The only added feature will be more on risks. There's, in fact, uh, uh, Matt, uh, Fred Fredrickson from uh, Car uh, Carnegie Mellon will be the last one in this series. And so it will not just be skepticism or optimism about whether um, LLMs understand, but also risks of understanding or not, even if they don't understand. So uh, if you're interested in the summer school, it'll be open to everybody online. Now, the reason that I interrupted you uh, early about the uh, about the Searle thing isn't because of a Searle obsession, but because there is a fundamental difference between lookup, which is what it is that is worrying a lot of people that are skeptical about understanding, which is it's like looking up, up something in an encyclopedia. Why would you want to say an encyclopedia understands? Well, one of the reasons you wouldn't say an encyclopedia understands, but you might want to say that a, an LLM understands, is because of the computation, which is a dynamical process. It, it is the execution of an algorithm. Uh, does that distinction figure in, uh, in, in anything that you're covering with your human examples. Yeah. Um, so I have no trouble attributing understanding to algorithms. Um, the question is, you know, one thing that I think, uh, 
one reason why the Chinese room continues to be this 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 uh, thought experiment that keeps coming up is that even now, right, that we have so many examples of machines doing seemingly intelligent things of a sort that didn't exist in uh, when Searle was writing about it, we have this intuition that you know if you kind of can peek under the hood and it's just this computation, we kind of bristle at endowing it with anything like the processes we have. And I think that's just a bias that, you know, we'll, we'll have to get over. Uh, there is, I mean, the, the more interesting question, right? So there's that, um, there's a kind of a, a comic that um, uh, was based on a cartoon that was based on the Chinese room that uh, Dennett um, co-created, right? Where uh, the, 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 the skeptical, uh, person, kind of like, oh, I, I get it. You, you, you understand. You don't understand Chinese. You're just translating it into into English. Um, and and person said, well, what what makes you think I understand English, right? Uh, we, we, we have a bias to think that you know, and uh, based based on Stephen and a lot of your work, right? That uh, understanding involves some kind of grounding in the world, something and. And what, what's been remarkable um, to me is, especially, I mean, it's getting moot with multimodal models, but how much can be recovered from um, about the world from text alone? Uh, it doesn't mean that we do it, but that in learning to lower the prediction error on large amounts of text, we seem to be inducing these more general models. And uh, this, I think, speaks to the flip side, right, of, you know, where we often think that a person who's blind cannot possibly truly understand something about visual appearance. And there's a lot of data to the contrary, right, that if they talk about color, they talk about things being transparent, right, that they're just parroting what sighted people uh, understand. And all the evidence points to the contrary. Their understanding is not equivalent to that of sighted people, but it it's there, I would argue. Uh, it's just in a slightly different form. Um, and maybe we can, I, I don't want to dwell too long on it. We can circle back around to it later. Steve already yeah. has a question. So uh, let yeah, me just, yeah, yeah. A, a quick reply. I'll be, I'll be brief. Yeah. Uh, blind people don't see, but they do have other senses and the yes. senses are not so different that you can't pick up something that you could have picked up from, from seeing from another sense and a little bit of common sense. So there's that answer. Uh, what I'm gonna give it to Steve right away. I just have a tiny question. Those grammaticality uh, tests that you were talking about, were they UG errors or ordinary grammar errors that you were testing or were they all mixed up? They were all mixed up and um, they were motivated by formal grammatical principles. Um, and one of our critiques was that some of the sentences, uh, while formally, according to some rule, you know, might be judged as ungrammatical, uh, would strike many people as perfectly grammatical. So it's it's just, you know, it's not legitimate to call it an error. There's no objective ground truth here. Um, yeah, I mean, the, there, the bottom line is that the many, many sentences that people agree on are ungrammatical. But there are also many sentences that people do not uh, agree on. Um, so the in that published study, it was all kind of mixed together. Okay. Uh, sorting it out might be a good idea for other reasons, but let me give it to Steve and then it'll be Rob. Steve, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, uh, hi Gary. What, what a wonderful talk. I did one of the best talks I've heard in this series, frankly. Um, oh, thank you. And I like the fact that you actually didn't answer your question about do LLMs understand? I mean, Obviously, from what you're saying, there's a bias that I can tell that you're leaning towards this is some, you know, kind of understanding. It's certainly yeah. a species of understanding. It's somehow similar. And human baselines, of course, are critical here, as you point out, when there's been so many silly things said and the, the various trolls out there complaining yeah. about things. They're, they're very similar. But here's the thing. I think you you hit on it very nicely towards the end here. Is says 
humans think of ourselves as unique and special. We're special because we have brains. Now, the irony of this is, of course, we don't understand how brains work. And yet we're perfectly willing to ascribe understanding to brains. And, right. and, and this, this irony comes out in your talk very well, I think. Uh, but on the same hand, we have no understanding of what uh, an LLM is, is mechanisms are. We have no idea what 900 billion connections create as some kind of uh, computational structure that emerges. It just emerged. It just appeared. And in this way, it's not only frightening to people like Jeff Hinton, who understands this, uh, I think, quite well, but I think it's also easy to dismiss because it's not special. It's something mm -hmm. we can't see inside of. It doesn't have a brain, and yet it seems to act a lot like humans, and your the cases in point are, are very well taken. So I'll stop there. Yeah, um, the... <laughs> The funny thing is that it can also sometimes run in the other direction where for people who, who do ascribe these models with intelligence and, and understanding, I think they then misascribe the things that they know about other systems that are intelligent and understand, namely people, which is that, for example, people are power seeking, at least some people, right? And so a lot of the concern about... Um, alignment and safety it comes from this intuition that, oh, these machines want to take over. And it's a very strange intuition because, you know, these machines are not agents in the world in the way that animals are and have evolved to be, to be competitive in certain ways, in case of primates, to be very status oriented, right? Why this other system, right, that can surprisingly tell you, you know, about balancing boxes and balls, should seek power, right? Maybe, but but that that seems like a strange assumption, sort of in the in the other direction. Yeah, yeah, but you know the answer might be not yet. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Steve. Mel, uh, it's Rob, and then Melanie Mitchell. Right. Hi, Gary. Great talk. Um, that was really Thanks, great Ron. food for thought. Um, so I was curious about your reaction to something. So I could see one kind of take home message from your talk, which would be very compatible with cognitive science, uh, which is we have to increase our assessment game. We have to work on assessments that get at uh, real understanding better. And I think of like well, Melanie's work with uh, ARC problems are example of that. The Bangar problems would be another. So the idea is maybe we need to have assessments so that simple kludges or spex wasps can't, yeah. <laughs> can't do well according to the assessment. But then I began thinking about what you actually said. And it made me think, well, maybe you don't think understanding is even a single thing that yeah. uh, uh, like a single assessment would be good at getting at. So maybe, you know, it's multiple intelligence a la Gardner, or maybe maybe it's a mistake to even think of, of developing these single better assessments. Yeah, no, I, I think both of those things, I think it's, it's important to have better assessments, but it's at the same time, um, we we need to be more critical. So Bongard problems, we've we've done work on Bongard problems. And, you know, one surprise, not, su not a surprise, if you think about kind of uh, intelligence in a more kind of formal computational sense, but a surprise given the data is, okay, you know, there's an, some rule, okay, that you think, okay, the person is getting this problem. Okay, they figured out the rule. You then test them on a new problem that uses the rule, the same rule, with some superficial uh, differences, and many people can't do it, right? And so they have not learned the rule in the way that the researcher thinks they have, um, right? And so this generalization is, right? Now, that to, to know that, that we need to test it. Uh, but we shouldn't assume that performance on a problem that was generated with a certain rule in mind by the benchmark designer by the researcher um, implies that getting it right requires knowing the abstract rule. And that that my last point that like, I think this is teaching us that there is much more 
multiple reliability of behaviors. Uh, it's pushing us as cognitive scientists to kind of think more creatively about this. Okay, to you, Melody. Welcome back. Hi. Hi, Gary. Good, Good to morning. see you Hi. and fantastic talk. Um, Thanks. So I think uh, it struck me that, you know, you, you, you said that one of the key parts of understanding is sensitivity to what's task relevant. And I think some of the examples that you gave of humans misunderstanding had to do with what task they thought they were solving. So like yeah. the example with the, um, the math question about how many school buses do you need? You know, mm -hmm. there, and, and one of them was, you know, two remainder 30, uh, mm -hmm was one of the answers. And, you know, if you think you're solving a typical math problem, maybe that's a good answer. If you if you actually ask them in some other situation, like, you know, we're out in the parking lot, how many school buses do we do we need to have yeah. come over here? They might get it right because they, they now know sort of what's the task they're solving. So often I yeah. think people are not, you know, maybe we're, we're saying that they make mistakes because they think they're solving a different task than we think we're asking them to solve. And I think that's something that I, I'm not sure that large language models are making mistakes for that same kind of reason. You know, they don't, they're not sort of using that same kind of theory of theory of mind of the uh, task uh, giver that uh, humans have. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I I think that's uh, definitely true, and it again pushes us more in the direction of paying more attention to context, paying more attention. So, uh, Steve Pantadosi and colleagues have a, a recent paper from the uh, uh, the Chimani um, doing arithmetic, right, showing that you can find people who are much better at um, doing arithmetic in fives than in ones, right? So plus five than plus one, which should not happen on a certain theory of how people do arithmetic but if what you've what you're mostly what you mostly have practice with is multiples of 5 in the context of trading um you develop that expertise and it does not generalize to add one and uh i think our our theories have often implied a kind of hierarchy of okay this is simple this is more complex. The more complex thing subsumes the simpler thing. And the, one could see that in the biases that people have, for example, with, you know, often people test uh, it's large language models, right? Non-scientists, you know, surprised by the lack of uh, like, how could it, how could it be so, so sophisticated and sensitive uh, in these cases, but can't do simple arithmetic, right? Because the assumption is that someone who can do arithmetic, who, who can do the more complex stuff, can do the simpler stuff. But these are different things, right? And um, and I think we 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 as scientists have a lot of the same biases, especially when it comes to these you know, more formal reasoning domains, where it becomes very hard to see how uh, getting this right can be done without kind of. In, in inferring some underlying more abstract principle. But domain after domain, we, we see that this is just not happening. So you have tasks that we think, okay, this is a working memory task. And so getting good at this task, let's say practice on this task improves working memory. It does not generalize to other working memory tasks because there isn't some single abstract underlying process that um, controls both of these tasks. It's more uh, situational and context specific. So, yeah, I think I think we we know this. We just need to kind of bring bring it synthesize that and bring it to bear to these questions more. So, I don't think I disagree. Great, thank you. Thanks, Steve. You wanted another crack at it. No, I. I, I I agree with everything. I think it's, uh, uh, you know, he, he's making some lovely points, but uh, I think Gary Cottrell has a question, which we can watch for here. Go ahead, Gary Cottrell. Um, 
Gary, I, I really enjoyed your talk. I thought it was great. Thanks, um, Gary. But <laughs> seriously, uh, this is a terrible question, but what do you think it means to understand? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I think <laughs> it would be a shame, right, if it involved some sort of subjective feeling of understanding, right? Often, that's what it comes down to, that you feel that like, okay, I, I think I get it now. That often comes with a better ability to explain it to others, right? But that's not a necessity. Uh, often, you know, being an expert in something like can can make it in some cases harder to explain, right? Um, I, I, I think those kind of desiderata are real, right? We do want to show consistency, uh, you do want to show sensitivity to, you know, the critical features or the more relevant features, right? What makes a magnet a magnet, right? Uh, if if you think of a magnet as something that sticks to a fridge, right, you have a more obviously limited understanding of, of a magnet. But at the same time, uh, we regularly ascribe understanding, you know, to people in situations, right, where it's very circumscribed and limited. And um, if you kind of make the prediction, okay, so if you understand this, you should be able to do this, we're often wrong. Um, and so I guess, I, I, you know, I don't think there is a bright line between uh, understanding and not understanding. Um, I think once one pays attention, for example, to the sort of, kids that errors make, you realize that, you know, kids are contradicting themselves all the time in ways that if you impose the criterion of consistency, you would need to conclude that, okay, they, there can't be any understanding here because there's a lot of inconsistency and that's clearly wrong. So I don't know. I think, you know, it's, it's gradual and graded and kind of distributed. Um, oh, yes. and, uh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sorry to hear you, you give basically the same answer Stephen would give. It's a feeling. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll make you happy by, by representing that because he's not really saying, Gary isn't yeah. saying. That. Yeah, no, no, I... I, I I I acknowledge that that's something that we we might be tempted to say, but but I think we should hope that it's not just that, right? That that that's not what it that, that, that what what oh, the I data agree. commit us to. I agree. Yeah. Okay, I, I'll come back on that in a second, but we have a question from here. Go ahead. Um, uh, identify yourself, please, and talk loud. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Iris, and I had a question while understanding. I feel like we uh, perceive it as something that's internal, but so I was wondering about what were your thoughts about a more social aspect of understanding, like understanding is also something that we construct based on our interactions with other people. And so there's a kind of a um, suspect that can be sometimes outside of us in the sense that uh, what we understand about something may also be very dependent on what models we inherit from interactions with other people. I don't know. Sorry, can you, can you, yeah. Can, can you repeat the last part, please? It's a, it was, here, I'll do it. I'll re repeat it for her that social interactions can be a component of understanding, including shared social models of what is the case. Am I, did I did yeah. betray what you said? Yes. And so, in, and like in that case, also, how does that uh, apply to? To, uh, to to LLMs, like how would that translate, is like fine tuning or like supervised learning, something that could be akin to that? Yeah. And uh, this is where the fact that uh, the development of the really impressive models is coming from, from right, companies that are not re revealing the, the, a lot of the details ma makes all of this very difficult. So, um, my sense is that uh, some of the big breakthroughs in LM performance came from not just the scaling of the model, but the 
the inclusion in the training text of corpora like Reddit, which are back and forths, right? So you have comments between people. Um, and so this is, of course, not the same as actually being in an in, in, in a live interaction with someone, but it's like observing it in a, in a certain sense, right? And so it's static training. It's you're not an agent in the scene, but you're you. I'm personifying the model here, but you're observing interactions. And I would love to know how much actually came from those types of training corpora as opposed to you know database dumps basically um the fine tuning also there is and maybe the details are out there and i'm just not aware of it it's not clear to me how much of uh, the role of fine tuning how much whether fine tuning is playing largely the role of uh basically you know register and tone kind of what is appropriate in a certain context you know as, as in terms of style versus uh, what um, um, uh, th this idea of of, of grounding through um, human reinforcement uh, learning uh, that idea right where in many cases right the person is grounding the model in some larger context of no this is factually wrong right uh, and what what role that is playing. And I, we, this is something we need to know. Uh, and hopefully soon with these larger open source models, we'll, we'll be able to, to test. Okay, um, we still have seven minutes. Well, uh, let me just, can I make a comment on this? I think there, uh, I don't think any of the open AI or Google, they, they have no idea what's going on here. I mean, it's, that's, that's part of the charm of all of this is we were yeah, yeah. one day it was it wasn't here and then a blue orb fell in your backyard and it was talking. And uh now we don't know why. And 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 the reinforcement learning what's been happening is if you take a raw GPT, you know, three or two from that time period, these things are uh really awful. They're aggressive, they'll yell at you, they they you know, swear at you. They 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 have the internet, so they've got everything that was the internet, they're throwing it at you. So what OpenAI has done is they built a bunch of filters and mm -hmm. the re reinforcement learning is basically preventing it from doing something. It's more of a punishment environment for these things. Do this, don't do this. And even in GPT-4, I spend a lot of time writing Python code with it. And the thing is like a very smart graduate student, it writes some code and then it makes errors. And I say, no, 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 no. That's not supposed to be in the loop. That's supposed to be outside the, and, and then it corrects it. Um, so, and I see it does better the next time. So the, the, it is learning while you talk to it. But look, there's something also folk psychology about this that kind of bothers me. If I, if my cognitive neuroscience friends might very well say in 10 years or something, hey, there's, you know, 25 networks between, you know, uh, prefrontal cortex and anterior cingulate and other areas that are all connecting together. And that's understanding. Uh, so I'm not going to be very satisfied with that, but, uh, you know, their experiments may suggest this is the basis, this is a mechanistic kind of structure, and maybe there's some differential equations that describe it. But the word understanding doesn't really supply much of the kind of mechanistic uh, source material to understand what it means. I mean, it's kind of too vague to get at what's happening here. I think folk psychology... Mm -hmm should have died with folk psychology so that's it. <laughs> yeah okay. any other comments otherwise i'm going to use up some of this time myself it's been too ecumenical uh gary i don't want you to come home feeling that everybody agrees on this stuff so uh let me do my bit please number one grounding I don't own the term, does not mean what most people use it for. And I want to remind you what grounding, or try to remind you what grounding originally was grounded in. It's sensory motor grounding, not word-to-word mm -hmm. -word grounding. That's essential for this. Bottom-up sensory motor grounding. And I continue to hold with a little bit more confidence every day 
So that's what's missing in chat GPT. You took the approach and it's very valid to look at um, whether a chat GPT seems to understand the, the kinds of things that see, people seem to understand and to misunderstand what people seem to misunderstand. And you found that there are some things that it understands that we don't, and there are some things that we do understand and they don't. And amongst us, there are things that I understand that you don't and vice versa. So this is all regular Congress. But the es es essence of it was also named by Gary Cottrell, and I hold to it. In fact, you know, I predict that it will turn out that what we all mean by understanding, once we figure out a lot more things than we, uh, uh, we figured out, is sentience, namely what it feels like to understand, what it feels like to understand. And that doesn't mean that you can't have partial understanding or not, not know if you understand. It's the same feels like as in any other sensory motor capacity, what it feels like to see red, what it feels like to see uh, something round, and what it feels like to understand Chinese or not understand Chinese. Because what Searle showed was that when you execute the when you execute the algorithm that allegedly passes the Turing test for understanding Chinese, you don't understand Chinese. And that's something you can address with your sentience. Okay, your your turn. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if I guess maybe maybe it comes from my kind of ex experimental. Uh, my grounding in experimental psychology, but I, I want to know, right? What does it allow you to do, right? So if we say, okay, the person understands Chinese, that comes with certain behaviors, right? They can talk to a speaker in Chinese and behave in appropriate ways, right? When we have the feeling of, you know, looking at a chunk of written text, right? We can see it, even though, even if we don't understand the language. But there is something extra, both you know, subjectively, when you can actually read the script, right? But it's not just that subjective feeling. We can actually derive meaning from it. We can do things. You can see a sign and now change your behavior in accordance with what was written on the sign in the same way that if you just see the sign but can't understand what's written on it, you can't. And so we can come up with behavioral tasks to show that, okay, when people say they understand, they also do X, Y, and Z. And I worry that if, it's, if, if we can't do that and we really have to rely on the feeling, well, where does that leave us? I mean, I, I don't wanna say the feeling isn't important because it could be that, you know, when the person, you know, in some learning task says, oh, I get it, that uh, along with that come, you know, their ability to do certain things. But if it's unconnected to anything that we can measure um, in, in a more objective way, I, I, I worry that that would lead, lead us to a bad place. I don't know. Um, uh, we are on, we are in that bad place. It's got a name. I'll give you a non-answer. Yeah. It is called the hard problem because we don't even know why seeing red feels like something. Right? Rather than behaviorally just doing what you need to do when you see a red when you when you view a red thing, that's called the hard problem. And nobody has anything on that. It looks like it's superfluous in both cases. But, but it's not it's, because because. It's it's very rare, if ever, that we get a true dissociation. So, for example, in a kind of statistical learning task, uh, you know, you're exposing people to some grammar. It's not hard to find that someone might be 60% right with 50% baseline and just be unaware of what they're doing. They're saying, I, I don't know, I'm just guessing. Ready to you can show that they're not guessing. But there is no one that is 98% right who says, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just guessing. So... It's very rare. I mean, there are some pathological conditions where we find some dissociations, but ordinarily we don't find, right, that's, that this subjective feeling of understanding can be dissociated from behavior. And so I, I don't agree that it has no functional purpose, I guess, right? So uh, I think, you know, like the philosophical zombies is an incoherent idea that we, th they would not be behaviorally identical because the, the subjective stuff plays a role. Plays a you functional would, role. You would win that one instantly and get a Nobel Prize if you could say why. It's okay to say that there can't be zombies, but if you can say why and it how is. there can't be zombies, yeah, you yeah, solve no, the hard problem. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.
very much for your talk. It was really very good. And, and agreement is not necessary for something to be really appreciated. Absolutely. <laughs> And, Thank you all. And, and, and keep coming back and, and uh, to everybody. It goes on until April and then comes June and there'll be even new stuff on this. And it's not going to end soon. Uh, thank you. Thanks, everyone.